we are in Bucharest, Romania. We are. <laughs> and I'm honored to uh, meet you here. Thank you. Please tell us um, about your work. Uh, what what are you doing? What's your career? Uh, what are your main ac accomplishments? And of course, what are you doing in Romania? Well, my name is Sam Vaknin. I'm a professor of psychology uh, in the outreach program of the CIAS Consortium of Universities. It's known as CIAPS, Center for International Advanced Professional Studies. And I am a professor of psychology and professor of finance in several universities in several countries. Until recently, actually, in Russia as well, I, I resigned my position in view of the, of the invasion of Ukraine. But I used to teach her. I've, I taught there for six years. I got to know the people. I got to know the environment. I met oligarchs. I met political leaders and so on and so forth. And while I, I deeply liked the people, I, I grew very alarmed with what was happening in, among the elites. The elites were being radicalized, nationalized. They lost touch with reality. They became delusional. They became more and more religious in the bad sense of the word. And so I, I really grew very alarmed. In the past two years, I, I taught only online, only you know, distance learning, because I really was very worried about what's happening there. And in, uh, in Romania? Uh, in Romania, what, I, have private, I came to, to work with private clients. I provide counseling and, and therapy and my own brand of therapy. It's a new treatment modality called therapy. So I'm working with, uh, with several clients. I was very surprised by the demand. But far exceeded my expectations, so I'll be visiting often. <laughs> I hope, I hope um, you know, to establish a permanent connection with this country. I like it a lot, I like the people a lot. You mentioned Ukraine and uh, this war. Um, what do you think about this war and um, what kind of consequences uh, from the psychology point of view will be in Ukraine uh, um, because of this war? Important to one very important fact that is often neglected in the analysis of this war, and I will not go, of course, into geostrategic or geopolitical, it's not my, my forte, my forte is a psychology. So, one, one fact that is often overlooked is that the Russians consider the Ukrainians their brothers, they actually call them small brothers. The, Ukraini, the Ukrainians over centuries, starting with the Kiev Principality, had an affiliation, not to say affinity. With, with Russia and with Russians, there are many mixed marriages, there are many hybrid populations, there are many people who speak Russian and yet identify as Ukrainians, and there are many people who speak only Ukrainian and actually uh, identify with Russia and aspire for Russian. It's not a clear-cut situation. So it's like, it's like an in internecine fight between brothers. It's like one brother killing the other. It's like Cain and, and Abel. In the Bible, this this background enhances the trauma involved in any war. It's like an interfamily feud, which results in bloodshed and so on. And the trauma in this case is much more enhanced than because the, the the brutality and barbarity of the war had been unexpected. While I think many people in the, in the last stages, before the war had started, many people anticipated an attack on infrastructure or an attack on the Air Force. So very few people had believed that the Russians will level cities, kill civilians, deliberately target shopping malls and schools and hospitals. Very few people believed that because of the common history and, and, and so on. Even people who were adversaries of Russia or regarded Russia as a malevolent, malignant force, couldn't bring themselves to believe that Russia will target Ukrainians because they are Ukrainians. That has been a massive shock in my view. And this, this places the template upon which uh, trauma evolves. Now we have two types of trauma. We have PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and we have what we call complex trauma or CPTSD. PTSD is a reaction to an event. You see someone killed, you get injured, your child dies, a bomb drops on the, on the school, something, you witness an event, or you're involved in an event, or you're the victim of an event, that creates PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. By the way, not in everyone, luckily, 
but in a minority, usually 10-20% of, of the witnesses. But still it's a huge number, because if a bomb falls and 1,000 people witness the event, 200 of them will develop PTSD. We can therefore safely say that PTSD we will have in, in Ukraine at the very least 3 million people with PTSD, at the very least. Complex trauma is even much more common. Complex trauma is when you are repeatedly exposed to a series of minor traumas. For example, having to leave your home, or having to watch your dog die, or having to see your school destroyed, or enduring hunger and thirst on the way to Germany. I mean, all these things are mini traumas. When they accumulate, we have a phenomenon called CPTSD, or complex trauma, which was first identified in 1992, so our understanding of this phenomenon is not complete, to use another statement. Complex trauma is much more common than PTSD, and that means that it's, there's a very high likelihood that 25% of the population of Ukraine will display post-traumatic effects. Now, post-traumatic effects are defined in the fifth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And trauma is, is a systemic affliction. Everything is affected. Your ability to think, your ability to verbalize, your, your ability to trust others, your ability to consider yourself positively, your ability to, to, to believe in a better future, your ability to sleep, everything is affected. Trauma is a systemic event which destroys all modes of functioning. You become less empathic, you are unable to sustain relationships, you have intrusive thoughts, you have flashbacks. Flashback is not just a memory, flashback is when you mistake reality, you think you're back in the, in the traumatic event. It's not just that you remember the traumatic event, but you're suddenly reliving the event. So, there will be flashbacks. Nightmares are very common, debilitating nightmares, and so on and so forth. These are conditions that last at least one month, but that's a joke. That's the DSM's joke on us. Most PTSD conditions last for years, and CPTSD lasts a lifetime. So, we are talking about one quarter of an enormous country, um, which will live for a very long time in a state of trauma and we're, will be unable to perform or to function both with themselves and with others, which will hamper any attempts at recovery and healing after the war. And there's, there's a series of mistakes when, it come, when we come to PTSD, a series of misunderstandings. The first one is that you could either have PTSD or CPTSD. You could either have the, um, the acute reaction, it's also called acute stress reaction. You could either have an acute reaction or a prolonged chronic reaction, like a chronic condition and an acute condition. That's wrong. You could have both. And many people will have both. The second thing is, is the belief that um, PT, uh, uh, traumatic reaction is immediate. You, you, you see a bomb falling next to you, you are immediately traumatized. That is not true. A traumatic reaction can develop months after the event. Now this is a seriously worrying thing what I just said. Because it means that we are going to look in Ukraine after the war is over, and the war will be over at one point, we are going to look at people and they are going to seem to us totally normal. And we are not going to treat them because they don't present any symptoms and any signs and you know, and then suddenly, a few months later, they will go berserk, they will disintegrate, they will fall apart, and they may even harm other people. So, it's like an insidious, slow-acting poison, which can erupt months later in people who, where we have no indication that it's at work. This is the second mistake. The third mistake is that we think that uh, trauma is universal. Like, as I said, if a thousand people are exposed to trauma, uh, to a traumatic event, like a bomb falling or someone killed or whatever, then all thousand will, will have some kind of trauma. Small trauma, big trauma, that's not true, luckily. In this group of people, there will be traumatized people. Some of them will have PTSD. Some of them will have lesser traumatic um, reactions. 
when there is a big group of people who will remain untouched. These are resilience leaders. What we need to do is to use or leverage these people who are untouched to help sustain, support, recover and heal those who are touched. Now what I've just said is a bit unorthodox because it, it's a different approach to healing trauma. It's instead of sending people with trauma to a clinician, to a therapist, to a psychiatrist, to a psychologist, we are actually sending people with trauma to other people who shared the same event, the same experience, but were not affected by trauma. And we believe that's a much more effective strategy. Also much more doable in Ukraine, because how many therapists and psychiatrists can you have in a country? You know, there's a limit. So we need to use the people who share the same experience to help each other. That leads me, leads me to the last point. And the last point is that it is wrong to consider trauma as an individual event. Trauma is a com communal event. It's a community event. When your village disintegrates, you don't lose only your home or your school or your dog or even your father and mother. You, you, you lose the fabric, the fabric in which you were embedded. You lose social connections. You lose your place in the hierarchy, relative positioning, because we all, all of us position ourselves relative to other people. Suddenly the frame of reference disappears. The context, people are plucked out of context and they feel adrift. They feel floating. They have no... So we need in, in a massive crisis like this, we need to work with communities, not with individuals, which ties in to what I said earlier. We need to work with people who share the same experience, are resilient, and belong to the same community. We need to rebuild communities. As we rebuild communities, the level of trauma will abate. Now, there are guidelines by the World Health Organization, guidelines that were created after the crisis in South Sudan, in Rwanda, to some extent Kosovo, and so on. And these are the guidelines today that dominate the treatment of, of trauma. The First Lady of Ukraine, is, has already announced that Ukraine, as a country, is going to deploy the WHO guidelines for the treatment of trauma. But we need to augment these guidelines. We need to augment these guidelines with a community approach. See, they're coming to take me. You need to augment it with a community approach. Because if you heal, if you heal the individual's trauma, but you don't provide the individual with a a refurbished and renewed context, the individual will relapse. There will be remission. Remission and then uh, yeah. relapse. And so this is, the, this is the challenge that faces Ukraine. Now there's a question of budgets. There's yeah. a question of allocation of resources. Yeah. How you and other experts can help Ukraine to recover well, at least I personally made myself available, of course, free of charge. Yes. I made myself available fully, uh, as long as it takes, to help to train local mental health practitioners in Ukraine to treat people. But this is less than a drop in, in two oceans. We need to establish a Peace Corps, the equivalent of a Peace Corps, of mental health experts from all over the world. Israeli mental health experts are very good with trauma some American mental health experts. Mental health experts from Asia and from Africa, where such disasters are very common, and so on and so forth. And we need to mobilize all these thousands and tens of thousands of mental health practitioners and so on. And they need to rotate, to serve in Ukraine, to rotate a month a year, I don't know, a week a month, whatever it is. It's, it's like, you know, when the, there was a Spanish Civil War, there was the International Legion, we need such a thing but of mental health practitioners. The problem with Ukraine is that the devastation of the infrastructure is, I mean physical infrastructure, is such that the absorption capacity of the country is extremely limited. Even if tomorrow we were to mobilize, let's say, 10,000 mental health experts, where do you lodge them? Where do, how do you transport them? Where, do you, what, where can they work? And so on and so forth. So we need, to, we need to reconceive of how to administer therapy in case of trauma. First thing, we need to go to the field. We need to have mobile units, 
sim simply mobile units, vans with two, three psychiatrists to travel to all the villages and all the and so on. Second thing, we need to work with the Ministry of Interior to to recreate lists of communities. So we need to, for example, take a village and we get a list of all the citizens and denizens before the war. We need to locate them. We need to bring them together. Now we don't need to bring them together physically, luckily. Yes. So we can create virtual communities, digital communities, put together. So there's 20 Ukrainians in Germany, 40 in Poland, 30 in Romania and so on. All of them belong to the same village. We bring all of them together in a in a global online digital village, and they have they have somehow to interact with each yes. other and to speak. Uh, of course, that's the idea. Um, yeah. The idea that this village is recreated online because at mm -hmm. this stage, and it's impractical to think that and to share somehow their uh, feelings, their thoughts, exactly. their uh, losses. Exactly. Their uh, some of them will be traumatized, some of them will not, and the ones who are not traumatized will support the ones who are traumatized with the mediation of a mental health practitioners. A mental health practitioner would be like moderator or supervisor. So this this would leverage each mental health practitioner will be able to cope with 5,000 people, 10,000 people, because he will have many helpers. These helpers will be members of these digital communities. You know, we have to use everything, technology, everything. The restoration of the infrastructure in Ukraine, judging by, for example, what, what happened to Nazi Germany after the war, it's the same level of devastation, by the way. It's, I don't need to tell you. Uh, the restoration will take something like 15 years. Something like 15 years. So we don't have, we can't wait for 15 years. We can't wait. For example, the rate of suicide among people with PTSD is 11%. 11%? Yes. If we are talking about, at the very least, 3 million people, if we don't hurry, half a million of them will commit suicide. It's it's an emergency. It's a it's a health emergency. It's exactly like cholera, <laughs> cholera or some infectious disease that breaks out. You don't say, well, there's infectious disease. We'll treat it in five years. You you it's an emergency. Yeah. PTSD is an emergency. Um, And um, this kind of trauma is uh, more intense in the case of children. Uh, it's a very good question with with a surprising answer. Children are more resilient than adults, more resilient actually than adults, but uh, the trauma uh, distorts their developmental path. So while they don't react as badly as adults, for example, the suicide rate among, uh, when you say children is not teenagers, Teenager, uh, teenagers react like adults, it's the same group. But uh, children, we usually, when we say children, we mean under the age of six. So children, in this age group, for example, the suicide rate is close to zero. They don't react as badly as adults. But it it has a massive and severe impact on their later life development. They become problematic as adults. Actually, we trace most personality disorders, like narcissistic personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, we trace these to trauma, early childhood trauma. The trauma of this type could lead to personality disorders, but even more so to mood disorders, anxiety disorders, which are lifelong, require medication, school counseling, follow-ups, and, and so on. And many of these children can develop antisocial behaviors. You could definitely anticipate an explosion in the crime rate, that's for sure. It's, it's a universal reaction, which is essentially post-traumatic reaction. Many, many children, maybe millions, left Ukraine. Mm -hmm. It's uh, a trauma. Yeah. It's a trauma in itself. This location is a trauma in itself. Yeah. Refugees are defined as prime uh, traumatic population, cohort, it's called. Yeah. Prime um, population, traumatic population. Immigration, dislocation, forced, of course, not willing. Yeah. Even willing, by the way, even if we immigrate willingly, it's, it's a bit traumatic, but definitely forced and sudden. Yeah, but For many of them, there were uh, there were no other options, of uh, so they were forced to leave uh, because otherwise they had to face bombs and of course, death, of course. daily of course. basis, daily. No one disputes this, of course. Yeah. But still, it's a, it's a trauma. The elements of trauma are the suddenness. You can't prepare for it. If you prepare for a trauma, the the level of trauma is much lower. Never mind how bad the event. If you have time to prepare. It's much lower. 
For example, we see different rates of trauma among cancer victims. If the cancer is slow and you have a pre-advice, you know you're going to die in five years or ten years, or your level of trauma is much lower than if you get a sudden type of cancer, pancreatic cancer or liver cancer, that kills you in six months. The inability to prepare, so the suddenness, the abruptness, and the dislocation are very traumatic in themselves.